Well, I've got to tell you this morning, the real problem with any attempt toward restoration today, whether it has to do with restoring a biblical understanding of salvation or how the church is led, revolves around the separation of the Lordship of Jesus Christ from obedience to his word. That's always the core issue as to why we get off track. In an attempt to create a new theology today, pundits are now disqualifying New Testament example as normative for all matters having to do with faith and practice. That's sad, especially when you consider what Paul told Timothy when he exhorted him by saying this. He said, Timothy, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Some have hitched their theology to the deceptive realm of relevancy, which has led us down the slippery slope to which I will call today Burger King theology. This theology has married pragmatism to narcissism to condition our churches today and our church members to believe that discipleship is all about me, myself, and I. I call this Burger King theology because it all has to do with having it your way. Have it your way. Have it your way. How many of you have seen the most recent Burger King commercials? This guy is scary, folks. You know what commercial I'm talking about, folks? He's there when you go to sporting events. At least that's what the commercial conveys. He's there when you wake up in the morning. He's there when you look out the window. He looks like a king. He walks like a king. But his whole politic is not based on monarchical authority. No, instead he's there to make sure that you have it your way. He's there to make sure your team wins on the gridiron. He's there to make sure that you have it your way in the morning when you wake up. He's there with that freaky smile on his face, waiting to find out what it is that makes you happy by assuring that you will get exactly what you want on your hamburger later on during the day. It's what makes you happy that counts. I believe the metaphor is obvious. Burger King theology teaches either directly or indirectly, the idea that God is always there to make sure you have it your way. God is here to serve you. And this kind of theology has affected churches and parachurch organizations across this country. Out of this milieu has come a new movement which is growing at an alarming rate. They call it now the emergent church movement. Have you heard about it? It's characterized by contemplative theology reflective of the ancient desert fathers. More and more churches, publishing houses, and parachurch organizations are signing on to the emergent church model. Where, here's the word, where discernment is discouraged and all forms of teaching, even false teaching, are embraced in an existentialist way. You see, the dangers of present-day emerging church coalitions, though attractive to many, to many, is still just an exercise in, let's face it, it's an exercise in heresy. When churches embrace all forms of teaching, they, in essence, have embraced full-blown universalism. On an emergent church website recently, I found that as a part of their mission statement, they are, and I quote, committed to the church in all its forms. Specifically, it says this, and I quote, We are committed to honor and serve the church in all its forms, Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Pentecostal, Anabaptist. We practice deep ecclesiology. Rather than favoring some forms of the church and, and critiquing or rejecting others, we see that every form of the church has both weaknesses and strengths, both liabilities and potential. It's just universalism, folks. The riddance of discernment 
coupled with the embracing of indiscriminate doctrine and practice, is now creating a wave of what I want to call today spiritual zombies. Moving but lacking the spirit of God in doctrinal integrity. When I first moved to Arizona, my stereotype of the, of the Southwest was tempered by cactuses and rattlesnakes. People were also telling me that the church in the Southwest was quite liberal. Well, I don't usually just let people just tell me something. I want to confirm it. So out of curiosity, during the first six months of my ministry there at Paseo Verde, I anonymously called 23 independent Christian churches to find out what I needed to do to become a Christian. Of the 23 churches I surveyed, 21 churches discounted baptism as a part of the plan of salvation vis-a-vis -vis for the remission of sins. And in almost every case, there was an overt attempt to soften the message for the sake of appearing like Burger King. Sadly, the general rule, I believe, is that we are leaning away from God is King theology, where God rules as an absolute monarch, to Burger King theology, mirrored in the substantive fa falling away from kingdom politics, while another phrase that I would like to coin with you this morning, I believe that there is Rodney King theology going around too, or the theology that says, can't we all just get along? Pragmatic theology is what it really is. And it describes the relational falling away from kingdom politics, which we should be practicing. That's the bottom line. Our tax should not be unity at any cost, but faithfulness to the Lordship of Christ, which beckons us all to unity on the basis of the king's policy, his politics. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, it refers to God as the blessed and only ruler. Did y'all catch that? It refers to God as the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Sadly, preachers and elders today have left their primary mandate of obedience to the word of God. Instead, churches are jumping on every pragmatic bandwagon that they can find, choosing to follow, without discernment, all the latest trends and fads, without any regard to truth. This has created, in my opinion, a volatile atmosphere of biblical misconception, which is indiscriminate, rudderless, of biblical misconception, which is indiscriminate, rudderless, and stands, I believe, in direct contrast to what the Apostle Paul refers to in Ephesians chapter 4 about leadership's purpose, which should be to right a ship that is being tossed in, to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Sadly, this is what's going on. In an Arizona Republic article from early December of 2005, examples of Burger King theology were highlighted as churches made the decision to not meet for the Lord's Day worship which, as we all know, in 2005 happened to be the traditional day that we celebrate our Lord's birth. And the headline of the article was, and I quote, more churches skipping Christmas Day services. And the byline of the article read as follows, and I quote, worship shifts to days before to let staff parishioners enjoy holidays with their family." And in the article, Jason Hamrock of Central Christian Church of Mesa is interviewed, and he says this. He says, and I quote, The church will hand out devotional guides at its five Christmas Eve services and urge people to utilize them someday on Christmas Day. He says, We don't fall into tradition around here. That's not what Christ would have us do. He wouldn't. He doesn't want us to go through the motions and carry on the routine, Jason said. Mark Chavis, who's a sociologist who focuses on religion at the University of Arizona, said that churches that are canceling Christmas services appear to be the churches that are growing. He said this just shows that churches, now catch this, he said, he's a sociologist at the University of Arizona, he said, this just shows that churches that are growing are less demanding of people and more accommodating of them. 
Burger King theology all over again. Have it your way, have it your way. So overall, we have conditioned people to become outlaws. Now, folks, I've read a lot of stories about outlaws in the Southwest. Let's face it. An outlaw law, by definition, is simply someone who chooses to, to do right in their own eyes. How many of you have ever seen the movie Tombstone and want to admit it? Tombstone is the story of the showdown at the OK Corral where Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, Virgil, and Morgan Earp fought the Clantons and the McLaurys on October 26, 1881. And I've often thought, as I was pondering about this and living in the Southwest, that just maybe some of our restoration pioneers, even our present day, maybe were born just about 100 years too early. They would have fit well in the late, late 1800s. Marshall Wyatt Earp could have been played by Marshall Leggett. A Bible-toting gunslinger ready to drop off a, at the drop... At the, ready at the drop of a hat to shoot down the outlaws of denominationalism in a definitive fashion. Virgil Earp. Who else could play that part but Ed Bowsman? He's a maverick of sorts who, whose quick draw and itchy trigger, trigger finger were always poised to aim as he would shoot from his 238s. What about Morgan Earp? Well, of course, that had to be Lee Mason because he was the inquisitive spiritual one of the group, always able to see and smell an outlaw two counties away. But what about Doc Holliday? Doc Holliday had to be Wayne Smith. The dentist. The dentist that was told many times by his patients that he never knew the roots went that deep, always telling everybody in town, I'm your huckleberry. Judges chapter 21, verse 25, warns us against such leanings. That is the leanings of Burger King theology. Through the aforementioned thinking, many people are just simply doing what's right in their own eyes. That's what it's all about. In Thomas Campbell's declaration and address, he presented the New Testament as a perfect constitution. He said, nothing ought to be received into the faith or worship of the church or be made a term of communion among Christians that, it is, that, that is not as old as the New Testament. My topic today is restoring church polity. I have grappled with this su subject for many months now. What a wonderful overall theme. Lee, you're to be commended for this. Restore. Restoring is a very interesting and fitting theme in our present ecclesiastical culture. Yet when I mention the word restoration... To most people today in our churches in the Southwest, I am amazed to receive a negatively passionate response which reflects an attitude indicating abhorrence to the idea altogether. In the midst of the history of restoration as an ideal, one major assumption has surfaced. That there is something lacking, askew, or downright unbiblical in our quest to unite people on the basis of the scriptures only. In our postmodern culture today, to assume that something is lacking in faith or practice, you see, is to place a discerning judgment on a teaching or practice. In a society where the prevailing worldview is, is that no one is really wrong, and that there is a shred of truth in all belief systems, restoring is certainly at least politically incorrect, and to some it's suspect. All this being said, restoring New Testament polity is more... Now listen carefully to what I'm getting ready to say to you today. I believe that restoring New Testament polity is more than simply claiming a narrow paradigm for leadership. Reflective of biblical example. All restoration of the church, when done in the spirit of the New Testament, will begin with the Holy Spirit's leading through the Word of God and an absolute obedience to the mandates of Christ, all summarized in an absolute obedience to his lordship. Without these two dynamics, I believe restoration will often fail. If we are going to restore church slash New Testament polity, then I think it behooves us to understand first 
that restoration is a noble, urgent objective. In my years at Cincinnati Bible College and Seminary, is it still around, by the way? Restoration was a constant biblical theme that was referenced in Bible and theology classes and in all the history classes. Following the old paths and the ancient paths is not an original restoration movement ideology. We are often exhorted in Scripture to look back and learn from past patterns and lessons so that they can have contemporary meaning and we can avoid certain things and we can espouse the right things. The children of Israel were told in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3, to remember the Passover as a celebration of their deliverance out of Egypt. David exhorts us to remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced in Psalm 105, verse 5. Jesus exhorts us to remember Lot's wife in Luke chapter 17, verse 32. We are exhorted to remember the depth of the meaning of our baptism in Romans chapter 6. The writer of the book of Hebrews reminds us that the need for restoration is perpetual. For there is always going to be the inclination to drift as indicated in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 and following. You see, restoration and remembrance is a core issue in the realm of proper discipleship. So what do we need to do then to restore New Testament polity? I'm going to approach this a little bit differently this morning, and I hope you catch my points very distinctly. Guys, I think we're, a point, we're at a point in the history of the Restoration Movement where we've got to go back to the basics. I think the first thing we need to do is restore an understanding of, and I'm going to phrase it this way, kingdom politics. Paul, in writing the church at Philippi, reminds us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Here's what he says. He says, but our citizenship, and that's a really cool word. It's the only time it's mentioned in the New Testament in the Greek. It's the Greek word polituma. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word used in this passage for citizenship is a very important word. You say, Barry, why? Well, you see, the context to the word in first century culture is derived from Rome's strategy to plant colonies of Romans at strategic points throughout the empire. These were not made up of conquered peoples, but Romans only. After a Roman civil war in which Octavian defeated Anthony, a Roman colony was set up in Philippi, which was located over 800 miles from Rome. That's a long distance. And yet, even though the distance was great, the Roman colony of Philippi was ne very near in their minds and in their lifestyle. And a picture of this can be seen in Acts chapter 16, verses 20 and 21, as the pride of being Romans showed through. This Roman colony was there to primarily preserve the pa Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. This was the great dream, you see, folks, of Romans, whose worldview revolved around the re recognition of one Lord who was the emperor. Every year on the anniversary of the emperor's birthday, Romans everywhere were called upon to pinch a piece of incense in front of his bust and audibly say these words, Caesar is Lord. And sadly, in the 21st century church, a, pinch, a pinch of incense is being burned and offered not to Caesar, but to our culture. My friend Joe Carson Smith back in Arizona speaks of it this way. Very simply stated, sola scriptura has now been replaced by sola cultura. First century Roman colonies were little Rome's placed in areas where its citizens were considered strangers and foreigners in the land in which they lived. Everything about them, including their dress, their customs, and their politic, were dictated to them from Rome. As a matter of fact, their children were educated to become proud citizens of Rome. They were taught to look forward to the coming of the emperor in all his majesty and in all of his pageantry. They were to be ready at any time for the emperor's coming. They never knew when the emperor would be there, but they knew within the realm of their own polituma that he could come at any time and they needed to be ready. Every aspect of this polituma 
was weighed in consideration of Roman policy, policed by Roman watch, watch guards, and organized according to Roman polity. On many occasions, the Apostle Paul appealed to his political status as a Roman citizen in an effort to accrue special considerations from Roman politics. An example of that is in Acts chapter 22, verse 28, where Paul refers to the confirmation of his own Roman citizenship. Paul points, now listen to this, Paul points to the book of Philippians as a reminder to the Christians there living in Philippi that they too are a polituma of heaven. The word from which we get the word church is ecclesia, which too was originally not a theological term, but a professional and an institutional word. Ecclesia means called out, but it also implies a calling together as a community. Yea, a polituma for the purpose of centralized government and adherence to an identified politic. Paul emphasizes to the Christians in Philippi that our citizenship is in heaven. Now listen to this. The Greek word here for is, is huparko, which expresses the continued state of a thing. It is unalterable. It is unchangeable. It speaks, listen to this, it speaks of a fixedness. You see, the politic of the kingdom cannot be changed by us. It must be kept the same. It is very important to understand that within a given city, there may have been different ecclesias, but there was only one Palatuma. Palatuma for a Christian was the very essence, essence of unity in policy, politics, and policing. This is an extremely important point, everybody. For a Christian colonized here on earth, called out of this world, called to the purpose of kingdom politics, serving an absolute Lord, Christ and King, it, is, it, it, it has a grave responsibility for us to follow. You see, for them in the first century, it was a grave commitment and fellowship, bound up in the absolutes determined by the absolute monarchical position of Jesus Christ and God as King over all things. Folks, that hasn't changed. You and I are in a kingdom whose policies should never change. We are in a kingdom where we have a responsibility to tell what the Bible says. It is the king's policy, you see. You see, to, to make the aforementioned practical, it behooves us to understand that we as individual churches must restore a kingdom perspective in matters which must be weighed out according to kingdom theology and practice based on monarchical dictates. It is the role of church polity to uphold and police these monarchical dictates. I'm thankful for publications like the Restoration Herald because they do something, a, a very good service to the kingdom of God, and that is that they help to police the Palatuma. We need that. Elders specifically in each ecclesia are to discern if faith or practice issues are consistent then with those monarchical dictates. Whereas in American culture, politics are seen as the craft of promoting the will of the people, in the church, politics are solely defined as the exercise of discerning the will of God. It's not that hard. You see, the politic of the kingdom is trying to discern what the will of God is and without reservation telling the people this is what God wants. Whereas in American culture, policy is a constitution which through, though static in principle, can be amended through, legislative, through the legislative branch of government. But in the church, listen to this, our policy is thoroughly static, unchangeable, and non-amendable. In restoring church policy, it is essential to bring a sense of kingdom politics back to the church unashamedly and absolutely. Kingdom politics, kingdom politics have nothing to do with Jeffersonian democracy. 
You see, the will of the people is really a non-issue. Ultimately, it is the role of those involved in church leadership to call everybody to total obedience to the one who is the authority, and that's Jesus Christ. You see, listen, church leaders have a grave responsibility to represent kingdom policy as the king has presented it, without any form of amendment and with no license of interpretation. Elders in the local church can only do this as they become familiar with biblical teaching and become vigilantly aware of the dangers of false teaching and false teachers. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.20 that we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. I think it's interesting that the Greek word for ambassadors is a derivative of the word presbyteros. The word, you see, had cultural reference to older, wiser men who spoke for the emperor. The term presupposes that the individual, this individual had a track record for representing the emperor faithfully. It is extremely important to understand, too, that as ambassadors, we are to consider the sovereign. Elders in the local ecclesia and within the parameters of the polytuma of the kingdom are to be devout, articulate representatives of the king's wishes, not of themselves. If we are going to restore New Testament polity, we must restore an understanding of kingdom politics. And then secondly, I believe we need to qualify and equip kingdom ambassadors. I call this, for lack of a better way of just labeling it, the politic of qualification. Teach, first of all then, I believe, even before, I'm not even going to get into the, listen, I'm not even going to get into talking about the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 or Titus chapter 1. I think there's deeper issues involved here. We already are schooled in that. We know that. They should be qualified biblically. But are we teaching them to be discerning? We should teach this imperative. It is the requirement for an elder to be a discerner. 1 Timothy 3, 2 says they are able to teach. That is, they should be familiar and skilled in doctrinal teaching. Titus chapter 1, verse 9 says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. You see, look, I, this is the way I think it is. Spiritual maturity, in a nutshell, is the process of learning how to discern. Discernment is a prerequisite to obedience. In Acts chapter 20, Paul warns the Ephesian elders to be on guard for themselves and for all the flock. Now, why was that? Paul says it's because they are ultimately going to come up against savage wolves who are going to get into the, to the pack, if you will, and not spare the flock. Paul says that there will be potentially those who will arise from their own numbers, speaking perverse things, seeking to draw away the disciples after them. Now, after them denotes the idea that there will be sheep who will follow these wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, follow them and why? Because they have learned to trust them in their deceitful ways and because they themselves are non-discerning individuals. I think that in the church in Jerusalem that the apostles convened with the elders there because they together would test doctrinal matters. I love this quote from D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said this. Matter of fact, I've asked one of the people in our church to paint this so I could put it in a, in, in a frame to put on my wall. I love this quote from Dr. Jones. He said, We have somehow got, got hold of the idea that error is only that which is outrageously wrong. And we do not seem to understand that the most dangerous person of all is the one who does not emphasize the right things. I'm again reminded that appointing elders without qualifying them biblically and training them to be discerning to me is like putting a gorilla with a torch in a room full of dynamite. You know there's going to be change in that room. <laughs> but the change agent has no idea what he's getting himself into. 
You see, if the evangelist in the local church is admonished to rightly divide the word of God, then how much more does it behoove the local eldership to be able to do likewise? John MacArthur, in his book entitled Fool's Gold, on page 200, says this. He says, modern evangelicalism, enamored with psychology and self-esteem, has produced a generation of believers so self-absorbed that they cannot be discerning. People aren't even interested in discernment. All their interest in spiritual things is focused on self, MacArthur says. They are interested only in getting their own felt needs met. I regret say, having to say this this morning, ladies and gentlemen. But trying to find truly discerning leaders in the local church today is like trying to identify the Amish militia. Now, now, now you, you would like to think that they're there, but the chances are pretty slim that they don't exist. You see, here's the reason. When false teachers entered the early church, Paul's admonitions were not sifted through postmodern, politically correct sieves. He called what was taught in the churches of Galatia another gospel, a perverted one, according to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Instead of politicizing the gospel or consulting the National Galatia Creek Association, he instead addresses the churches of Galatia with great passion. As a matter of fact, look closely and you'll see that th his letter to the churches of Galatia were quite biting. Not once does he refer to them as saints. He never thanks God for them. He never praises them. His warnings are very severe, and he begins chapter 3 by calling them foolish, saying in chapter 4 that he may have wasted his time teaching them, indicting them in, great, in chapter 5 by saying that they had even fallen away from grace. And the books of Colossians and Hebrews bear similar rebukes, and the writer of the book of Hebrews summarizes the situation, in my opinion, in chapter 2, verse 1 and following by saying this, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Are the elders in your church discerning elders? Are they being taught to be discerning? Can they tell when false doctrine is being taught or when some kind of pragmatic practice is being pushed that ultimately goes against the spirit of the New Testament? A lack of biblically discerning elders in local churches is the primary reason we have doctrinal confusion today. It's not the pragmatically driven preachers today who are ultimately to blame. It's, not the, non, it, 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 it's the non discerning elderships that are ill equipped to identify false teaching. And the root cause for having non discerning elders is the fact that we as preachers have chosen too often to abdicate our role of equipping elders to be discerning. And let me say this. There is more, there is much, much more to qualifying an elder than just surveying a list of qualifications. Is that elder a kingdom thinker? Does he know the king's policy? Can he discern when a strange politic has infiltrated the realm of the polituma? Historically, Whenever the church veered right or left away from political orthodoxy, it was then that the church embraced unbiblical, heretical practices. And the ultimate assimilation of Roman and Jewish concepts of status, power, and priesthood into church polity were themselves a result of faulty, indiscriminate kingdom politics. Because of these changes, and hierarchical power structure was perpetrated upon the local churches. When Paul told Titus to appoint elders in every city, as I directed you, according to Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he was going against, you see, listen, Paul was going against the customary cultural practices because, you see, in both Jewish, in the, in the Jewish synagogue and in Greco-Roman society, one man oversight was commonly practiced. You know what that means to me? It affirms that pluralistic eldership was the intended norm and not the exception. And why? Because if Paul wanted to promote Burger King theology, he would have structured the church to fit the culture. 
Alexander Strzok, in his book, Biblical Eldership, raises a rhetorical argument concerning how we view church polity by saying this. I find it ironic that some evangelical leaders in America are more concerned about the structure of the United States government than the structure of the local church. I doubt that many evangelical leaders would say it doesn't matter how the U.S. government is structured as long as there is some form of leadership. Yet that is precisely what I have heard some evangelical leaders say about the local church. You see, if we're going to restore New Testament polity, then it behooves us to restore, listen to this, an understanding of kingdom politics. Qualify and equip kingdom ambassadors. And then thirdly, assure, listen to this, assure the integrity of eldership through plurality. I would call this the politic of quantification. I believe it was in God's plan for multi multiple elder polity going against popular cultural politics so that elders would always understand that there's only one head of the church and there's only one chief shepherd. I am a duly elected elder. I stand before you today as a duly elected elder in the church I serve in Arizona. Now hear me, hear me out on this, everybody. I was not made an elder there until after six months, giving the congregation time to know me and discern my qualifications and my intent with the church. It is my personal opinion, and remember, this is a true opinion today. And my opinion is, is that this paradigm provides a furthering for the New Testament church in its plurality of leadership. I am only one of 10 elders at PVCC, the Sao Verde Christian Church, yet function as a double honored elder, laboring and preaching and teaching. We have an atmosphere of mutual respect and complement each other's strengths and weaknesses, but we're truly on the same team. Now, I gotta be honest with you, and you can punch me out later if you want to, but you may be in church as preachers where your elders say, well, we still consider you a part of the eldership. But there's a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a difference. Because when you know you're shoulder to shoulder with your fellow elders, you work more as a team, in my opinion. We have an atmosphere that I think is very healthy and promotes New Testament Christianity. I believe that this paradigm also helps to guard against real and perceived forms of monarchical leadership. Now, the following are examples from the New Testament that give a normative pattern for this plurality in eldership then. Restoring New Testament polity means restoring a normative pattern for local churches to follow when seeking to ordain elders as a body of leadership. And you know what I'm going to do at this point? I'm going to skip over these. They're in your manuscript. Those ambiguous manuscripts floating around out there somewhere. But let me just say, there's plenty of scripture to confirm the fact that the plurality of leadership is in its eldership. If we are going to restore New Testament polity, then it behooves us to restore and understand and have an understanding of kingdom politics, qualify and equip kingdom ambassadors, assure the integrity of eldership's plurality, and fourthly, exercise behavior indicative of New Testament calling towards obedience. I call this the politic of duty. First of all, the congregation to its elders. I believe the congregation has a responsibility to its elders. I wish our congregations knew this. Most of them don't for some reason. And I think the, bold, the elders of the churches need to be bold enough to say it. There are many definitive exhortations and examples of, of a congregation's responsibility in protecting, yielding to, the discipline of, selecting, restoring, obeying, and calling their elders. These examples give us a normative example for behavior of congregational members toward their local elderships. And again, I won't give you the whole list, but let me say there are many things that the congregation ought to be doing in a responsibility towards their elders. But I believe the elders also have responsibility towards their congregations. Elders, if I'm speaking to you today, remember, you have a huge responsibility. You're to be discerning. You're to be qualified. You're to be in the spirit of New, of New Testament kingdom politics. 
But you're called to do a lot of other practical things in the New Testament. Read your manuscript later. The purest sense of a biblical ecclesiastical polytuma is modeled for us in the New Testament then. Within the polytuma, select men are given by example as duly chosen polity, functioning as leaders concerned with kingdom politics. Look deeply, everyone, into the picture, and you will see a plurality of elders slash bishops slash shepherds or pastors who function in plurality, duly qualified and duly quantified. Yet their role is to always point the ecclesia. Their role is to always point the ecclesia to the true and only senior pastor, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 5, 4. I hate that term. People call me pastor back at Paseo Verde, everybody. And I said, and I always remind them, I'm only one of ten. And I teach them good New Testament teaching on the eldership and its plurality. This is not monarchical le uh, leadership here. We don't have a, monarchi a, a monarchical episcopate here. Okay? But I try to te teach them that there's only one senior pastor. I'm only the preaching pastor, a teaching pastor. Because he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the one mediator between God and man. He's the senior pastor. When I was a kid, I used to love to spend summers at my grandfather's in southern West Virginia. He used, we used to play in the creek that cascaded to the lowest part of the property looking for crawdads and fishing for bluegills. We were often warned never to drink the water because several families living in the hollers north of the property ultimately dropped runoff of all kinds and all sorts from the water sources in their homes and even from the outhouses on the edge of the, of the, of the creek. You see, though it looked pure, <laughs> it really was contaminated as the last runoff from all the surrounding lands. One day I asked my grandpa if there was really any reliable source of water anywhere in the area. With a gleam in his eye, he grabbed me and we walked up into the hollers. We scaled up onto the side of the mountain where we found a pipe coming out of the side of the mountain where pure water was coming from that was suitable for human consumption. It was then that my grandfather told me that this spring was the ultimate source for all pure water in the surrounding area. People from all around the hills and the hollers would come there resting assured that it was a reliable source for water. A spring of living water quenching the thirst of many where people could count on the reliability of its source. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is time to restore our church's leadership to a recognition of the living water where only at its source can we assure people confidently and competently that the water is pure. We must beckon, we must exhort, we must lead those that, that are around us to realize that the source of pure water is a journey. So let us restore the journey. But first, let us equip men to understand the nobility of restoration in the journey to that source. Pray with me, if you will. Oh, dear God, bring us leaders today who will restore our quest again to define the height and the depth and the breadth of Christianity by the old book's parameters. Lord God, bring us leaders who will restore our quest to again preach deep truths in a shallow society, ill, yea, drunk on the indiscriminate and ill-defined. Oh, Father in heaven, bring us leaders who will restore not only the integrity of preachers and elders, but preachers and elders whose passion for New Testament Christianity is unintimidated, determined, and unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it and it only is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. Yea, Lord, restore us, not just, restore not just the technicality of rightly divided truth, but the spirit of truth where there is no choice but obedience and no loyalty but to his lordship. My God in heaven, deliver us from the fads and the fashions of syncretized cultural flirtation in not only our belief but in our leadership. 
Restore us to book, chapter, and verse in our passion, our purpose, and our persuasion. Most holy God, remind us of our forefathers who stood firm on your word and whose banner was not to restore some poor facsimile of historical traditional faith, but who instead chose to beckon us back to Jerusalem to again hear the words of Peter, to walk the dusty streets with Paul who called uncompromisingly upon culture to be transformed into the image of Christ. Lord, raise up leaders today. Lord, who will never cash in their ambassadorships and forget that they are called to carry a message from the King of Kings that never changes. Raise up leaders today, Lord. Today, who, whose only passion is Christ, whose only purpose is faithfulness, and whose only position is uncompromisingly anchored to the rock of ages, the Lord of all creation, the only Savior and hope for all mankind, the King over this embassy we call the church, and the King whose power and authority transcends the practices and the pragmatism of a culture gone mad. Yea, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our absolute monarch, our absolute passion, Lord, our only politic, the basis of our citizenship, the hope of all ages, God our Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, to Him be all honor, praise, glory, now, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, or until our Lord returns for His church. We pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.